to record. We have now started recording. And I'm about to mute everybody. Remember, Bruce, to unmute yourself. Okay. Away we go. Yep. Okay, good afternoon and good morning. And I guess for our uh, overseas brethren, good evening. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, ships mail during World War II. Okay. As you may recall, Following World War I, there was a lot of economic hardship, which completely decimated the French naval fleet. And since World War I was the war to end all wars, uh, they tried to, all the, the winners, tried to limit the capabilities of the uh, aggressors. And with respect to navies, uh, the Washington Naval Treaty was established in 1922, which limited the size, the overall size of the Navy. And for some reason, Britain and the USA uh, each received 525,000 tons, and Japan 315,000 tons. France and Italy got 175,000 tons of permitted uh, naval capacity. They also uh, limited the number of guns that people could have. Uh, however, during this time in the 30s, you remember Mussolini uh, started becoming active in Italy and France and Italy were frequently sparring partners. And Mussolini started building the Littorio class of battleship. Uh, where previously the strategy for Italy and France was to build smaller ships and more of them. Now this was a large ship and was gonna be more powerful than those dreadnoughts of the First World War. So what was France's response? Well, they said, okay, you're gonna make a big boy. We're gonna have a big boy too. And so plans were designed to build four battleships. And the first one, uh, they laid a keel and it was gonna be called the Richelieu class of battleship to complete, compete with the Littorio class. So by 1939, two battleships had been started, uh, the Richelieu and the Jean Bart, but other smaller and faster ships were also in process. Now, by 1939, France had built up to, to have the fourth strongest Navy in the world, uh, the British, American, and Japanese Navy being the other three. Uh, in comparison to the two designs, uh, I've, I've got here the Littorio on the left and the Richelieu on the right. And you can see they're all very comparable. Uh, for those Anglophiles, uh, we're talking 380 millimeters is about 15 inches. Uh, and then six inch guns for the 152, 155 millimeter size and on down. So comparable armament, comparable capabilities apart from uh, the Richelieu had a lot more fuel on board and so could go 8,500 nautical miles as opposed to Latorio. Uh, for 3,920 nautical miles. Now, for comparison to the American battleship, I present the USS Massachusetts, which as a Cub Scout, my son and I spent a weekend aboard this vessel. So we saw this from the inside out, uh, slightly smaller tonnage, uh, guns are a little bit bigger. Those are 16 inch guns versus the 15 inch guns on the Richelieu. But beyond that, roughly about the same. It was a little bit slower, but could cover a lot more ground. And uh, if you've ever been in a 16 inch gun, 
Uh, it's you could sleep inside the barrel. They're big, uh, and and they they had pneumatic assist to load the powder after the shot. Now, France had a a network of military post offices similar to the U.S. and these were distribution points for FM mail. You're familiar with the FM overprint on stamps. However, with the collapse of France to German occupying forces, the beginning of World War II, several offices closed and others were opened in theaters of war as the war progressed. So you can see uh, the Naval Post Office uh, ended up closing uh, about the time of Germany's attack on France. And you can see the progression as the post offices start closing as they go further and further south. Uh, there was a considerable system of naval post offices for uh, military mail. And they each had a number. And I just present to you the list because you'll see many of the same names uh, for the naval ship overprints. Uh, for instance, uh, Bizerre, Marseille, Oran, Toulon, Alger, Casablanca, Dakar, and so forth. So you see there was a considerable network. Well, Germany invades in 1940, as, as we all remember. Uh, and, and now the French Navy is, is worried. So they decided to abandon ship and get out of town. Uh, and they set sail for uh, North Africa. There was a cat and mouse type operation to escape the British warships and, and German occupation. So it was a, they were caught between a, a rock and a hard place. And you're gonna see a little bit later on Operation Catapult, which was July, 1940 off the English coast that they had to evade. The Richelieu was incomplete at the time, but had to get out of town. It was, it sailed from Brest to Dakar in Africa to escape, continued on to Casablanca and back to Dakar. Uh, British warships noticed the, the ship there and attacked the French fleet in Dakar to prevent ships from being captured by the Germans. You remember the Vichy government was very sympathetic to, to Germany. And uh, those renegade captains uh, were trying to save the ships away from the Germans. It was actually sunk in shallow water and used as a gun platform for quite a while. Uh, refloated six months later and then moved out of Dakar. Uh, the Battle of Dakar repelled the British and that was considered the only victory for the Vichy government. Uh, November, 1942. Uh, the Yanks get involved in, in the fighting and, and the French fleet is now working with the free French. Uh, it was quite some time bef you know, because various commanders were sometimes sympathetic with the Vichy government and sometimes not. So the French fleet now on the allied side takes up positions in North Africa and there begins initial correspondence with Canada and the USA from the European theater using the uh, APO station in New York City as the transit point. Uh, and subsequently, uh, US troops in North Africa created APOs wherever troops went beginning in November of 1942. And realistically, by 1944, with so many allied troops on, on the continent, there were greater than 300 APO offices in France. 
Uh, now the RF overprint of the US six cent stamp was used beginning 1943 in North Africa for destinations in the US and Canada. There were a lot of soldiers involved. There was increased communication and the US and Canadian military defined a solution for the legitimate use of mail. Uh, you may recall that naval ships, large ships had their own post office. And that's the same situation in the US Navy. Uh, the US uh, offered to provide postage stamps and stamped envelopes and issued a directive of the Navy March 13th in 1943 saying, where no French postage is available and cancellation is made by the French post office, US postage may be used with the letters RF overprinted thereon in accordance with International Postage Convention Agreement. The French postage attached affixed must be canceled by a French postmark and used US postage by US or US Navy postmark, unless such US postage has been overprinted as described above. So that's the beginning of the French RF overprint on American stamps. There was a tariff change at the time in 1944 in the US where domestic air rates went from six to eight cents on the 26th of March. However, to maintain troop morale, military mail was kept at six cents. And the same situation uh, to Canada uh, was kept at six cents. Now, uh, in June of 1944, there was an additional directive that specified how these were to be handled, that all mail censored with a seal or bagged, uh, had to be censored with a seal or bagged as uncensored letters and prepaid with the six cents and the RF overprint. The date stamp would be an anonymous to hide the location of the ship and it would just simply read post naval. The, the local naval base or ship would make up the overprinting device. And instructions from Algiers sent to the Naval Bureau at Oran uh, uh, indicated so. Genuine RF covers therefore cover the period of March uh, in 44 to October in. 45, and they are hard to find. The RF is supposed to be applied to stamps affixed to letters, but uh, mint RF overprints were done uh, for philatelic purposes. Well, just to refresh your, your geography, uh, and I'm going to Stop for a minute here. Uh, the French admiral told the bulk of the ships that were in Toulon, France, before they evacuated to France to support the Germans. But against his will, the captains of those ships scuttled the, free, the fleet, which infuriated the Nazis. And as a result, Germany took control in 1942 uh, to make sure that the French supported Berlin's goals, uh, therefore uh, overruling the Vichy government. So the, the French had several naval bases in Africa. And here you, you can see uh, Oran, Algiers, and what is Anaba, which is Boone uh, at the time. And the Allies had a plan to get the Germans out. And so the Allies began going after the French ships and, and in the result, uh, prior to the French going over to the Allied side, there were about 1,297 French sailors and many ships ended up on the bottom of the Mediterranean. Uh,
Okay, letters from military base went by email after being censored and on large French ships, there could be over a thousand soldiers on a particular ship. And so that's why the overprint scheme was developed. It used the six cent red uh, US stamp, uh, Scott number C25, or the six cent orange stamped envelope, which is Scott UC2. So we've, we've got the order of June 22nd, 1944, extended the RF procedure to Oran and Algiers, and then presented to other locations. I'm going to go through uh, what the various designs were. And there were multiple designs in many of the bases, because after, you know, these are hand made crude devices and after a certain number of uses they became uh illegible and so this is the algier type one overprint and i'm going to ask you to note the the shape of the serif on the f and the slight dip in the r inside this is believed to be a fake of that same type one. And you can see that the serif is, is much fatter. It does not come to a point. And the opening in the R does not have that slight recess at the bottom. So here we've seen blown up. Uh, this is believed to be the fake one, and this is a genuine one. Algier had a type two overprint, and this is a representation of that. And you can see the characteristics of the leaning R, and there are no periods. Now, if we go to Oran, Oran had a very interesting one in that it was an RF inside a circle. But note the the angle of the F. Uh, this is a genuine one, and it, it looks somewhat italicized. These are fake ones, and you can see the, the foot of the R as well as the F do not resemble. Uh, uh, let me go back. do not resemble the genuine one. You can see the R is, is a, more or less a straight line. And here it angles. Anava, which at the time was Bun, uh, has a much smaller one. And I have two examples of that here. And notice the period after the F it is higher than the baseline of the RF, whereas the other period is within that baseline. These were all hand stamped, so it's not unusual to find differences in depth of print, uh, darkness, that sort of thing. Now, if we go to Dakar, we see two designs. This one is the type one design. And it's a pretty bold in this, and the periods are square. This is a type two and some catalogs don't recognize it as being genuine, but Sarah's does, so I've included it here. Uh, otherwise, it's a nice pretty script. Kutanu in Benin is on the 
uh, the bottom down here. Dakar was over here. And here's the first type from that location. And you can see the periods are mid, mid in the design. This is a, the second type of overprint. And you can see it's italicized and, and the line weights are very weak. Now, if we go to Tunisia, there are four designs from Bizert. The first one I'm looking for. So if somebody has one, I would be most interested if they're willing to part with it. Uh, this is from a series catalog, and uh, I, I show the reference here. It's a rather bold RF print. Uh, and, you know, a common joke is what's the most expensive stamp? The last one in the series. So that's, that's going to be the most expensive stamp for me. This is a type two from Bizert. And you can see it's, it's loaded with serifs. Here's a type three, rather plain in design. And lastly, type four, uh, nope, that's type three again. Like number four is, is pictured here. We go to Casablanca, it had three designs. Here's the first one, rather fat and squatty. Second one, tall and thin. The third design, uh, rather excessive pressure in the overprint, but the periods are likewise mid design. Toulon near Marseille had one design. And this is characteristic, it's missing the, uh, the second period. Uh, it also shows that booklet stamps were also issued for use on naval ships. And this is the bottom stamp in a booklet. Marseille next door is, has the, a square outlining the RF overprint. And you can see this, uh, this is outside the normal date range. So this is philatelic. Uh, there are RF overprint covers on the embossed six cent orange cover, as I say, and that's from March 13th, 44 to October 45. I just don't happen to have any. So in summary for that series. They did serve the purpose for getting mail from French ships to allied destinations when French postage was not available. Uh, obviously getting French postage for the free French forces was not easy, uh, given that the Vichy government was the one issuing the postage. So numerous offices were required to do multiple handmade overprinting devices. And that's why we have the RF overprint in various variations. Uh, they were hand applied so that you get different strikings of the same copy. And postally used copies require the postal date stamp within the period of use, sensors markings, both inbound and outbound. So, uh, the other rather famous naval postal history is that of the battleship Richelieu. And it created a special overprint and cancellation. And if French stamps were not available, local stamps with the ship's overprint could be used. 
And just to this particular photo uh, shows it in 1943 after it had been repaired in uh, New York City. Quite impressive. Uh, so it was built in Brest, commissioned uh, as soon as it uh, possibly could to get out of France, July 15th in 1940. A uh, large displacement, 813 feet long with a beam of 108 feet wide, uh, took 31 feet of water to keep it afloat and could cruise at 30 knots. It had a crew of 1,670. Uh, you saw the, the guns before when I listed them, but note the, uh, the armor. Uh, that, that is impressive. Uh, something in the order of 14 inches of steel around the, uh, the hull. Uh, no wonder it was such a heavy ship. It had three flying boats, which were removed in a retrofit in New York City. But this is a, a picture of one of the flying boat, not on the ship, but a model of, of what they had on board ship, which I thought was rather interesting. They also, also had catapult planes. And if you recall, uh, the first uh, sailing of the Ile de France to, to uh, New York City, they had uh, Scott numbers three and four, the same Iver number uh, with the 10 franc overprint. So they were launched sometime uh, before reaching the harbor to accelerate the mail uh, by one day for that particular venture. There were postal facilities on board. It wasn't a large room. And uh, I never found a picture of the actual uh, post office within the ship. I've seen post offices of other ships and there it's basically a closet. The special overprint was applied to the stamps used on board and, and they could use the local stamps with the overprint if French stamps were not available. Uh, just to give you a, a perspective of why we had foreign stamps on these overprints, after the sinking, the ship was repaired and used as a gun platform in, in Dakar. By September, it had more damage. Uh, April of 41, it went reduced speed to get out of the way and suffered some more damage. And by November of 1942, uh, it was in North Africa going between Casablanca and Dakar. And Operation Torch uh, was the Allied attack on the Vichy forces. And actually, uh, the USS Massachusetts that I listed earlier attacked the battleship Jean Bart. The, uh, the Richelieu exchanged fire with the British uh, battleship Barham. And that's basically when the French Navy switched allegiance. It was ordered in January, the end of January, 1943 to New York City for repairs to get it out of the theater of war and docked in New York City in February 18, 1943. Now, this was a rather tense situation politically because uh, the Americans didn't want, didn't know how much to modernize this ship, seeing as how uh, the ship had only uh, joined the Allies recently. So uh, the Allies had radar. And after much discussion, they, they finally said, okay, we're gonna add radar to the ship. They repaired the torpedo damaged, installed modern anti-aircraft guns, put in more ammunition, additional men, removed the catapults. And here is a picture of the ship coming into New York Harbor. Uh, they actually had to take off the top part of the uh, fire control tower in order to get the ship underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. 
you can see here the uh, second turret has damage. In fact, they removed the inner barrel on the starboard side. So uh, you recall the uh, the airmail stamps from 1928 with the Ile de France. Well, New York stamp dealers wanted to get the ship to authorize uh, mail sent from the ship to New York City, even though it was docked in, in a Brooklyn berth. Uh, the ship's commander in the New York post office said, uh-uh, no, and the idea was silenced. However, as true to form, when there's a will, there's a way, and some few correspondence did occur originating by the ship's postmaster, Monsieur Charvet. Uh, and uh, the postal agent uh, did allow a few letters to pass through the New York post office, was brought up on charges with the Maritime Tribunal. He was later acquitted since he had no benefit from that particular operation. And this is an example of one of that rare mail from the ship to a Nassau Street dealer, uh, the famous New York City Stamp Street, uh, with all the requisite postings censored by the French, censored by the US, the uh, signature of the postmaster on board ship, the ship's name, the hexagonal uh, marking of the ship and the overprint on a French stamp. And in this case, the overprint is upside down. Following the repairs, uh, the Richelieu uh, then joined the British Navy from November 43 to March of 1944, and covers of these are rare. Uh, and note, there are no overprints uh, showing the Bâtiment Rouge. It's just the ship's cancel on a British stamp. And these are not in my collection, and I have referenced my source in reference number nine, but just to show that they, they do exist. So the, it, it joins the British Navy and ended up patrolling the North African Atlantic coast, ended up going to Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka today, April of 44, back to Casablanca, Indochina, India after VE Day, and ultimately retired as a troop training ship in 1948 uh, for tours in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Uh, it was tired and ended up being stationed in Toulon in 1952 and used as a naval artillery training vessel. It was decommissioned in 1967 and scrapped in La Spezia, Italy. Uh, here are some of the French issues with the overprint from the battleship. And these are all in my collection. Uh, so you have those and here are more French issues. And notice on this one is on this on its side, just the way the, the sheet was oriented when he was doing it. Uh, when it went to Mauritania, they used local stamps, and here are two from that region. When it went to Senegal, uh, here are, they have five stamps from Senegal. Here are two of the more often seen stamps. And then here are the other two 
and I happen to have a color error of the 125 stamp. So you can see the color, correct color is in red, but this one used the 75 centime color with the one franc 25 plate uh, with, with the uh, Richelieu overprint. And the last one from Senegal is, is this particular stamp. It went to Algeria, and uh, there's one stamp known uh, to have the overprint from Algeria. How do you tell a good one from a, a forgery? Well, here are some characteristics, and I've taken the, the one off the postcard uh, to show you because it has a nice light background so you can see the overprint more clearly. It has several, the surcharge has a border with several breaks. One's at the top of the O of Avignon. It's hard to see, but it's between the S and the T of Post. There are two at the bottom uh, between the anchor and the U, uh, one larger than the other. And the first T of Bâtiment, you can see that the right hand top portion of the bar is short relative to the left. All surcharges were hand stamped. And so you're going to have pressure differences and you're going to have different orientations uh, depending on how the person did it. And I include this one uh, as the last Richelieu overprint, uh, well, cancellation. Uh, following the war, President Vincent Oriol uh, took a trip on the battleship to North Africa. And this is a commemorative cover from that trip sent back to uh, an individual in Pantin. And here's a, a stamp that was issued by France to commemorate his 100th uh, year of birth. In summary, there are not many Richelieu surcharge stamps. There are about 2,000 in quantity. Uh, and the most numerous is the one and a half franc red brown pétain, about 1,500 represented by that issue. All of the others total of about 500. And the, the uh, auction house that seems to specialize with this was La Postale. And they organized a sale exclusively of Richelieu overprint stamps in 2015. Uh, mine were actually, the majority were purchased prior to that sale, but uh, that represents the biggest sale of, of those stamps. And I have a long list of references, some English, some in, in French. Uh, So there's, it's been an interesting subject to research. And so I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Bruce. And let's open it up to Q&A from all around the world here. Remember to unmute if you want to ask a question. The uh, last picture, that was after it was retrofitted in New York? That's correct. OK. Uh, note, there are no catapult plans, uh, planes at the stern of the ship. Uh, and they would have been uh, pointing aft. The uh, black or the dark markings on the side was because they didn't paint it? or. Was it some sort of camouflage? Uh, that was very likely camouflage. That's uh, there were very similar and uh, exotic designs that were used to to fool visual uh, uh, inspection on the high seas. Observers, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, 
I'll ask, did the overprinted stamps uh, match the airmail surcharges, the rates? I have not looked into that. I uh, Obviously the postcard does because it has a, a US six cent stamp on it and it would not have complied uh, that would have covered the postage in the US soil. But I have not, I don't have any covers that were sent from the battleship with the overprints on them apart from the postcard. How did they, how did what they are the sources of the uh, unused uh, overprints? Uh, were these found in post offices in the, in the the cities that were using them or, or where did they all come from? Uh, to me, it's a supposition. I don't, I don't really know, but uh, the reason why there are mint copies without cancellations is that they were retained for philatelic reasons. And it's, it's not a subject that is uh, collected widely. So, uh, there still are not a lot of them around. I know back in the uh, early 1950s in the France and Colonies Philatelists, there were a number of articles uh, about the legitimacy of the Richelieu overprint. And the consensus then is what we, that it was fraudulent and a collusion of New York stamp dealers that were involved with it. Uh, although that cover from New York looks entirely legitimate to me, uh, although obviously involved with some collusion with the post office purser on the ship, uh, but it looks very legitimate. I think none of the other stamps with the Lucio overprint from the colonies were ever used, and I've never seen any on cover at all. They have very high catalog values, but I wonder what the price was or the sale was in 2015. How did they do in the uh, postal philately sale? Did they do well? Uh, Every one that I have seen has done well. And yeah. all, of, all of my examples have certificates. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, at least the overprint is genuine, whether it was, uh, you know, for philatelic purposes or leftover stock, uh, I can't be sure, but mm -hmm. they all did come from the Richelieu. I have a pair of the Senegal uh, Richelieu overprints that are signed by Sanabria, uh, but not with the certificate, but uh, uh, they're quite a fine acquisition, a nice addition to my France collection. <laughs> Well, I was quite fortunate. I ended up getting all of the Richelieu stamps uh, apart from the uh, commemorative cover and the postcard in one purchase. Mm. Mm. Uh, it took several payments to do that, but it was one purchase. I know the uh, US specialized catalog, I happen to have the uh... 2018 version open on my desk here uh, does say that in essence you need them on cover because they can't be sure that the overprints weren't applied after the period of use or like you say for philatelic purposes. Right. And every time I've seen one for sale, I've been outbid. And actually, I, I did bid on the, the one that I don't have, but I was outbid for that one too, the, uh, the mint copy. But in, in auctions, I do not see many. There's a couple of common ones that you see all the time, but uh, they, they don't come up often. True enough. 
there's an interesting book on the topic of uh, Roosevelt de Gaulle and the Post. I think it's available through the APS by Kenneth, oh, uh, Jan Greco. Uh, I don't know if they're, it's, uh, yeah, it details, uh, you know, the uh, RF oval prints and has chapters on various uh, sub chapters of the period. Uh, Roosevelt, De Gaulle, and the Posts. From a purely historical standpoint, there's a relatively recent book called Casablanca that uh, tells a good story about how the, uh, the Americans and the Brits and uh, Josephine Baker is brought up in it because she worked <laughs> for the Allies, how they started in North Africa, but essentially how Casablanca was really important. It isn't just the Humphrey Bogart movie that makes Casablanca an interesting place. And the Easton Press, which is reasonably well known in the United States, publishes leather-bound, uh, gold-tipped page books of various old novels and, and nonfiction. And they have published a book on the, uh, the military, I think it's the US military's uh, description of the North African campaign. And it's, I read that and I found it fascinating. Obviously it's got a, a military flavor to it and it's got certainly the American viewpoint, but uh, it talks about the, the uh, discussions with the French military commander in Oran or Mers el Kabir, which is where they ultimately scuttled the, the French Navy, saying, you know, join or die, right? <laughs> you guys have a choice. And uh, they originally made the bad choice and the Navy got sunk. So uh, it's a, it was an interesting book. Can I just ask Bruce a question, please, about the... Uh... The, the Six Cent Airmail stamp. Um, obviously, I was taking great interest in the overprints, but I was equally interested in the engraving of the stamp itself because uh, it's been an opportunity to see it enlarged to, to such a, a high degree. Firstly, the, the aeroplane, is it a genuine aircraft or is it just uh, um, an artist's license to show something which is uh, representational of, uh, of, of a military plane? It's the real thing, and I think it's a DC-6 Skymaster. Yes. I've just been looking in my catalogs. There's no reference to what the, uh, what the aircraft is at all. Yeah. Yep, yeah, it's, it's the real thing. The real thing. Right, thank a you. DC, I'm sorry, a DC-4. DC-4. But my, my, my second question, I was intrigued by the, by the engraver's skills on that. And I was looking at the um, impression that he has created of, of the turning of the propellers, the propellers. I'm absolutely fascinated the way he'd done it because he'd had to set one propeller blade back behind the housing to give the right impression of, 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 the, of the revolutions and the speed. It's a very clever design. I'm just wondering if the artist is known or whether he was given any credit for that uh, for that design. I think it's absolutely a superb stamp. Not being a collector of American stamps, I've not examined it closely before, but seeing it on the screen there, I was, I was much impressed. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure he's been credited in uh, Joel, Max Joel or uh, Saul Glass's book. I can't remember which one covers this period. Uh, but they, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing does know who the, yeah. the uh, yeah. artists who designed the stamp and then the engravers, who they are. Oh, thank you. I think it's interesting that France at the time had a similar series with the airplane. Going up to the 50 franc. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I I grabbed one of my my uh, books off the shelf here. This is the uh, Max Joel book, and I think the 
when was that issued in 41? Let me see if I can find it for you quickly, Mick. Anybody else have questions while I'm doing some homework here? If not, um, I will let everybody know that at the beginning of our present of our meeting this afternoon, um, Gary Withrow posted a website. Uh, RMPL, Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, rmplauctions.org, and they have a sale that includes some French stamps, including a number 21 with a certificate. He encourages anybody interested to go to their website and look, and to bid, of course. Uh, Gary, when does that close? Closes next Sunday around noon. Okay. And there's a stamp show in Denver next weekend. So come out for that as well. Oh, no, 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 no. Save <laughs> your money and come to Washington, D.C. When's the Washington show? The Washington show is June 3rd through 5th. It is uh, actually an official meeting of, the, of our France and Colonies Society. Uh, um, Friday morning, we'll have a... Uh, meeting of a membership meeting and a, uh, two presentations. One of them will be from me and the other from our corresponding secretary, Jerry Dutt. And mine will be uh, a test drive of, of a, an updated presentation about my uh, Algeria up to 1830 that I put online here for this group recently. And Jerry will be talking about the main, uh, I was going to say the oil palm climber from Dahomey, but I'm not sure of that. He may have picked something else for the Washington presentation, but those will be Friday morning, June 3rd. Are you going to Zoom those meetings? Uh, no, we won't have the technology available for that. I'm sorry. Okay. So if you come um, out to the, to the Denver show, we can Zoom it for you. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yes. Well, I've, Tim Barchi and I have had conversations for years, but um, some of you know that I have attended the Coca-Cola 600, the NASCAR race, which is Memorial Day weekend in Charlotte, North Carolina for the last 20 years. And I can't be in two places at once. <laughs> oh, that's good. So, um, I will say that there was a year when Memorial Day weekend did not fall on the same weekend as the Rocky Mountain Show, and, I, and we actually did meet out there for that. Yeah. But that's been a long time ago now, probably 10 or 12 years. Um, Can I, let, the okay, NAPEC, also, <coughs> go ahead. <coughs> the NAPEC schedule says Jerry's talk is Introduction to French Military Mail, <coughs> 1890 to 1960. Thank you. That's right, because he and I, he's also president of the Collectors Club of Akron, and I'm the secretary, so I sit next to him at every meeting now. And uh, he looked over at me and he said, man, I bit off a lot when I put that title down. So I don't know if he's actually going to cover all of that or not. <laughs> um, the next couple of months, uh, we have, I just had it up on my screen here. Next month, Mike Bass is really going to be here to do his French Holy Land uh, presentation, which should be a good PowerPoint, just like Bruce's. Uh, following that, Loic, you're going to do this at, on the fourth Sunday in July, and I don't have a note as to your topic. I think you sent it in an email. That would be, that would be on the Fournier forgeries. Oh, the Fournier forgeries. Yes, I'm oh. going to put that in here right now. I, you know, I, I think I knew that. I think you did, but it's okay. <laughs> yes. In August, we are not going to have a meeting because this, that weekend corresponds to the Great American Stamp Show in Sacramento, 
So with any luck, a uh, number of us will be there. And I am chief judge at that show. So I will definitely be busy and not uh, able to host a Zoom meeting for us. And then in September, we have Ed Grabowski, who's going to do a program on the one son team rate. And I have a faint record election that last month somebody volunteered for October and I couldn't find the little piece of paper I wrote that on after the after the meeting was over so I may uh I may be you know was it Jeff what what what's that Jeff Bone was it oh you? not me yeah uh, yeah I said I could make a presentation I don't know when but whenever you tell me how's fourth fourth Sunday in October Okay, and that will that I'll do an email back and forth with you, and you will we'll get a good title and a short description of it. And we'll get that posted as well. I thank you for that. So we're good through October, and if we want to keep doing this, we'll need more volunteers after that. So, anybody else have anything they want to bring up while we're all together? No? If not, I'm going to stop the recording. Where's my recording? Right here. All right.